From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'll give it to you blow by blow if you want. I have lots more stories to tell. A monster moved to Anchorage in 2007. Israel Keyes did not look evil. He appeared normal. To those who crossed his path, he seemed like a dedicated businessman, a doting father, and a loving boyfriend. No one could see the darkness lurking inside him. But by the time he moved to Alaska, Israel Keyes was already a thief, an arsonist, a rapist, and a serial killer. He did not give up these hobbies when he arrived in Anchorage. With 2.8 coffee shops per 10,000 people, Anchorage, Alaska has more coffee shops per capita than anywhere else in the U.S., including Seattle. Some of these shops are walk-in establishments, but many are small drive through shops. The Common Grounds Espresso Stand, located at 630 East Tudor Road in Anchorage, is a small drive through shop, measuring 8 feet in length and little more than that in width. Normally, only one employee at a time works at the coffee stand, and customers either drive or walk up to the window to place their orders. 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was thrilled when she landed a job as a barista at the Common Grounds Espresso coffee stand. It was the perfect job for a friendly young woman who loved being around people. Her father, however, did not share her enthusiasm. He wasn't pleased to learn his daughter would be working alone at night. But Samantha pleaded and assured him the stand was equipped with surveillance cameras as well as a panic button should a barista need to summon the police. Samantha was a beautiful brown-eyed brunette with a bubbly personality and a dazzling smile. After working at the coffee stand for only a month, she already had several loyal customers. On February 1, 2012, Samantha worked the late shift and was scheduled to be there until closing time at 8 p.m. She didn't have a car, but her boyfriend promised to stop by the stand and give her a ride home. Israel Keyes had been planning to burglarize the Common Ground stand for several days. And on the snowy night of February 1st, he pulled a ski mask over his face, parked his car down the road, and walked to the stand. He had not decided what he would do when he reached the stand. He planned to rob the shop, and if conditions were right, he would kidnap the barista. Keyes arrived at the stand at 7.55 and calmly ordered a large Americano. Samantha prepared the drink, but when she turned around to hand it to him, she gasped at the 22 caliber Taurus handgun Keyes pointed at her. He told her to turn out the lights and then hoisted himself through the window and inside the coffee stand. Samantha apparently was so terrified by the intruder and his gun, she forgot to push the panic button. Keyes told Samantha this was a robbery and when she said her boyfriend or father would be there any moment to pick her up, Keyes thought twice about abducting her. Keyes had two ground rules, to never hunt close to home and to never use his own vehicle for an abduction. He had already broken the first rule, and he hesitated to break the second. After all, he had parked down the road, so he would need to walk Samantha down the street to his vehicle. Keyes later told investigators he lost control, and with a rush of adrenaline, he decided to take the chance. Keyes walked Samantha out of the coffee stand, and with his arm around her and his gun pointed at her side, he forced her to continue down the road. 
Samantha nearly broke away from him once, but he caught her and told her he would kill her if she tried to escape again. Once he'd secured her in his truck, he asked Samantha if she had a debit card, and she told him her card was in her boyfriend's truck, which would be parked on the street in front of her father's house later that evening. Keyes drove Samantha to the house he shared with his girlfriend and young daughter and tied her up in a shed next to the house. He told Samantha he would kill her if she screamed, and then he turned on a radio in the shed to cover up any noise she made. Next, Keyes drove to Samantha's father's house, located her boyfriend's truck, broke into the truck, and took Samantha's debit card. Samantha's boyfriend, who was already on edge and worried about Samantha because she wasn't at the coffee shop when he arrived to pick her up from work, heard a noise and looked out the window. He saw Keyes near his truck and called to him to ask him what he was doing, but Keyes managed to get away with the debit card. Once Keyes had Samantha's debit card, he returned to his home, and being careful not to wake his girlfriend, he poured himself a glass of wine and took it back to the shed with him. He sipped wine and then raped Samantha while she sobbed. After he was finished with her, he slowly strangled her to death, wrapped her body in a tarp, and stuffed her in a cabinet in the freezing shed. By then it was morning, and he woke his daughter, got her dressed, and then called a cab to take them to the airport, where the two departed for New Orleans and a cruise he had booked months earlier. Key's girlfriend flew separately and met Keyes and his daughter for the cruise. After the cruise was over, Israel Keyes left his daughter with relatives and drove to Alito, Texas, where he burglarized and burned down a house. He then drove to Azle, Texas, and robbed the National Bank of Texas. Next, he drove to Houston, and he and his daughter flew back to Anchorage. On February 19th, Keyes dropped his daughter at school and then returned to his home, removed Samantha's body from the cabinet, and had sex with her frozen corpse. A few days later, he applied makeup to Samantha's face to make her appear alive, sewed her eyes open with fishing line, and photographed her with a recent newspaper. He then included the photo with a ransom note to Samantha's family, telling them to deposit $30,000 into Samantha's bank account if they wished to see her alive again. He planned to use her debit card to withdraw the $30,000 from her account. A few days later, Keyes cut up Samantha's body and dumped her remains in Matanuska Lake near Anchorage. In early March, Keyes flew to Las Vegas, rented a car, and drove to Wilcox, Arizona, where he used Samantha's debit card to withdraw $400. Ninety minutes later, he withdrew money in Lordsburg, New Mexico. Keyes wore a disguise when he made the transactions, but an ATM security camera recorded an image of the white Ford Focus rental car he was driving. The image did not capture the license plate, but it was clear enough to determine the make and model of the car. Ironically, Keyes had mechanical problems with the car and returned it to the rental agency in exchange for another vehicle. But to his bad fortune, the rental agent issued him another white Ford Focus. Two days later, on March 9th, Keyes withdrew money from an ATM in Humboldt City, Texas, and the FBI alerted Texas law enforcement officials to be on the lookout for a white Ford Focus. On March 13th, Texas Highway Patrol Corporal Brian Henry spotted a white Ford Focus parked at a motel in Lufkin, Texas. When Keyes left the motel, Henry followed him and noticed the car was traveling three miles over the speed limit. Henry leaped at an excuse to stop the car, and when Keyes handed him an Alaska driver's license, Henry called for backup. He knew the suspect in question was wanted in connection with a crime in Alaska. 
and the driver of the Ford Focus was not only from Alaska, but also looked like the photos of the disguised individual who had used Samantha's card at the ATMs. Henry felt he had probable cause to hold keys and search the vehicle. In the Ford Focus, police found a dye-stained roll of bills from a bank robbery, the mask Keyes wore while withdrawing the money from the ATMs, a gun, and Samantha's debit card. They arrested Keyes, and a few days later, Alaska state troopers escorted him back to Anchorage. At first, Keyes refused to talk to investigators, but on March 31st, he admitted to abducting Samantha Koenig from the coffee stand. He said he would give authorities more details eventually, but he would talk only if they could promise to keep the details from the press. He did not want his daughter to read about everything he had done to Samantha. Keyes had friends and neighbors in Anchorage, as well as a list of happy clients from his construction business, and he said he needed to get used to the idea that now these people would know who he really was. When the federal prosecutor pressed Keyes on the issue of whether or not Samantha was dead or alive, Keyes told him she was dead, but said he wasn't ready yet to give them the details of her murder. He said, I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'll give it to you blow by blow if you want. I have lots more stories to tell. His words stunned the investigators in the interrogation room as it slowly dawned on them they were sitting across the table from a serial killer. Keyes demanded two things. First, he wanted a speedy trial and the death penalty, and he wanted the death penalty carried out within a year. Second, he wanted to keep the details of his crimes secret from the news media. He told investigators that unless they met those two demands, he would not divulge information about other crimes he might have committed. He did agree to tell the investigators the details of his abduction and murder of Samantha Koenig, as well as where to find her body. And a few days later, police recovered her remains from Matanuska Lake. Samantha's family had her cremated and held a memorial service for her on Easter Sunday. When investigators discovered information on Keyes' computer about a missing Vermont couple, they confronted Keyes with the evidence and asked him what he knew. He smiled and told them they were lucky because he'd planned to throw the computer into a landfill when he returned to Anchorage from Texas. At first, he told them he would only talk about the Vermont case if they scheduled his execution date and promised he would be executed within a year. Finally, though, he told them he left the bodies of Bill and Lorraine Courier in an abandoned farmhouse near Burlington, Vermont. When the prosecutor asked Keyes how he knew the Couriers and why he decided to murder them, Keyes became annoyed with what he considered was a stupid question. He said he didn't know the couriers. It was just random. Keyes explained his usual routine was to fly to an area of the country, rent a vehicle, and then drive sometimes hundreds of miles to find a victim. He buried murder kits around the country in areas he found interesting, and he often buried these kits years before he carried out a crime in that area. He placed each kit in a plastic five-gallon bucket with a tight-fitting lid, and included such items as a shovel, plastic bags, money, weapons, ammunition, and bottles of Drano to help dispose of the bodies. Two years before killing the couriers, Keyes stashed a murder kit near Essex, Vermont. Then on June 2, 2011, Keyes flew to Chicago, rented a car, and drove nearly 1,000 miles to Vermont. After spending a few days fishing and relaxing, Keyes began scouting the area for a victim. He ultimately chose the courier's house because it had an attached garage, providing covert access to the house. He also chose the house because no children lived in the residence. Keyes said the only rule he had for himself as far as victims were concerned was to never kill children. 
Keyes entered the courier's garage and broke into the house through the door leading from the garage to the house. He attacked the couple in bed while they slept and took them to an abandoned farmhouse. He restrained Bill in the basement, but when Bill tried to escape, Keyes lost his temper and shot and killed him. Keyes then sexually assaulted Lorraine and strangled her. He stuffed the courier's bodies in black garbage bags and left them in the basement of the abandoned house. A few months later, when the farmhouse was demolished, the bags containing the bodies were unwittingly transported to a landfill. After Keyes admitted to the crime and specified where he left the bodies, Vermont law enforcement officials searched the landfill, but the courier's bodies have never been found. Keyes hinted about some of his other crimes to investigators, including a bank robbery in New York, the burglaries of 20 to 30 homes across the U.S., a rape, and several homicides. But he loved playing games with his interrogators and only offered small details of these crimes. He claimed that in the summer of 1997 or 1998, he abducted a female while she and her friends were tubing on the Deschutes River in Oregon. Keyes said he sexually assaulted the girl and then sent her on her tube down the river. He estimated the girl was between 14 and 18 years old. According to police records, no one ever reported this crime. Keyes said he committed his first homicide between July and October 2001, not long after being discharged from the Army. He did not tell investigators the identity of the victim nor where he left the body. Between 2001 and 2005, he said he murdered a couple in Washington State, but he provided no information about the couple except to say they were buried near a valley. Between 2005 and 2006, Keyes committed two separate murders and disposed of at least one of the bodies in Crescent Lake, Washington. Keyes admitted that on April 9, 2009, he abducted a female from a state on the East Coast and transported her over multiple state lines into New York. He said he buried her body in upstate New York. On the same trip to New York, Keyes robbed the Community Bank in Tupper Lake, New York. In April and May of 2011, Keyes admitted to staking out two spots near Anchorage where he considered killing people, but then changed his mind. In June 2011, he murdered the couriers in Vermont. And on February 1, 2012, he abducted and murdered Samantha Koenig. FBI agents believe Keyes murdered at least 11 people and possibly more. He traveled extensively around the U.S. between 2005 and 2012 and made several trips outside the country. According to Keyes, only two of his victims' bodies had been recovered. One was Samantha Koenig's, and the other was the body of a victim he staged to make it appear she died from an accident. He claimed when authorities recovered her body, they did indeed rule her death accidental. On May 23rd, Keyes appeared before United States District Judge Timothy Burgess in federal court for a hearing to set a new trial date. Samantha Koenig's family and friends were in attendance. Partway through the hearing, Keyes broke free from his steel leg shackles and jumped over the railing into the first row of seats in the gallery area. Spectators screamed, get him and kill him, while deputies tackled Keyes and used a taser to subdue him. Deputies later learned Keyes had removed the chain from one of his ankle cuffs, but they couldn't figure out how he managed to do it. When the FBI relayed the information Keyes told them about the courier's murders to law enforcement personnel in Vermont, FBI agents asked Vermont officials not to release Israel Keyes' name to the public, explaining that Keyes agreed to talk about his other victims only as long as his name was kept out of the press. In July, Vermont investigators 
announced that the murderer of Bill and Lorraine Courier had been arrested and was in prison in another state after being charged with a crime in that state. They explained they could not release more details at the present time. As soon as the press conference ended, though, WCAX-TV in Burlington, Vermont, released a story reporting that anonymous sources had identified Israel Keyes as the courier's killer. Keyes was furious when he learned the press had connected him to the courier's murders. He felt betrayed and stopped talking to the FBI and Anchorage police detectives. He became increasingly concerned if he admitted to crimes in other states, each jurisdiction would want to try him separately, and the judicial process would drag on for years. He wanted only to stand before a federal judge, admit he was guilty of abducting and murdering Samantha Koenig, and receive a death sentence scheduled to be carried out within a few months. He now felt the entire process spiraling out of his control and saw no reason why he should talk about his other crimes. Keyes emphasized he felt no moral obligation to the families of his victims to explain what he did to their loved ones. He expressed no remorse for his crimes. Investigators who questioned Keyes said he was arrogant and sometimes seemed bored while relating the details of his crimes. But when talking about an abduction or murder, he'd get excited and sit on the edge of his seat, adrenaline coursing through him while he described every minute, grisly detail of what he had done. In late November, Keyes met with investigators, but by the end of the interview, he seemed distracted and told them he might be willing to talk to them the following week. Two days later, at 5.57 a.m. on December 2, 2012, a corrections officer performing a security check in the Anchorage Correctional Complex Bravo Modules Segregation Unit noticed a strange red-colored streak on the floor of cell 3. He instantly realized the streak was blood, and when the inmate did not respond to his calls, the guard summoned medical assistance. When medics pulled back the blanket from the inmate's bed, they found Israel Keyes lying face down, covered in blood. Keyes was pronounced dead at 6.13 a.m. Keyes had slid open his left wrist along the vein, and a razor blade attached to a pencil rested under his body. Wanting to make sure he succeeded in killing himself, Keyes laid on his stomach and tied a bedsheet noose around his neck. Then, with his left leg bent back toward his buttocks, he tied the other end of the sheet around his left ankle. This configuration ensured that when he lost consciousness due to blood loss, the force of his leg lowering back down to the bed would tighten the noose around his neck and strangle him. To keep the guards from noticing the blood as it flowed from his wrist, Keyes collected his blood in two milk containers and two cups until he passed out. And he did all this while remaining nearly motionless under his blanket. Investigators noted Keyes carried out his own death with the same methodical planning he had used to abduct and murder his victims. His suicide was so successful, the medical examiner could not determine whether he died from blood loss or strangulation. Prison officials still have not determined how Keyes obtained a razor blade while locked in a segregation cell. Investigators were crestfallen when they heard about Keyes' suicide. Now they would never know the details of his other crimes and the locations of the bodies of his other victims. Keyes left a four-page suicide note on a yellow legal pad, so saturated with his blood it was unreadable until the FBI lab in Virginia restored most of it. Even after the re restoration, though, parts of the note remained indecipherable. After studying the suicide note, the FBI concluded there was no hidden code in the message, nor did the note offer any investigative clues to the identity of other possible victims. 
The note seems to describe a victim's final moments and provides a glimpse into the arrogant, evil mind of Israel Keys. Israel Keys did not like being called a serial killer, even though he knew the term applied to him. He admitted he admired Ted Bundy, but he stated he did not copy Bundy and his ideas were his own. He resembled Bundy in several ways, though. Both killers felt they possessed their victims, and both were methodical planners. Both chose and killed victims in different areas of the country instead of in one particular city or region. But Bundy's murders were spread throughout the U.S. because he often moved from one location to another. Keyes purposefully chose to murder in places far away from where he lived in order to avoid detection. He often traveled partway to his chosen location by airplane and the rest of the way by car. Also, while Bundy targeted only attractive young women, Keyes had no victim profile. He admitted his victims ranged from young to old and were both male and female. He had no connection to and did not know his victims before abducting and murdering them. Keyes was also careful to turn off his mobile phone and to pay for items in cash when on a murder trip. A national expert on serial killers stated Israel Keyes is one of the most organized and intelligent serial killers he has ever studied. Like Ted Bundy, Israel Keyes was a heavy drinker. And also like Bundy, as his appetite for murder and the adrenaline rush he got from taking risks increased, he became more careless. He took chances he had never taken before when he abducted Samantha Koenig. First of all, he chose a victim near where he lived instead of traveling across the country to find his prey. Secondly, he told himself if the barista working at the Common Grounds coffee stand did not have a car he could use to abduct her, he would simply rob the stand and leave. But he ended up abducting her anyway, despite the risk. Finally, using Samantha's debit card to extort ransom from her family proved to be his downfall. He disguised himself when withdrawing money from the ATMs, but he carelessly allowed his rental car to be photographed by the ATM camera. Keyes admitted to investigators that when he saw Samantha Koenig, he could not stop himself. He did not have the control to walk away from her. Killing had become an addiction for Israel Keyes, and in the end, he could not control his addiction. Thank you for listening, and please check the show notes to find references for this podcast. I am an author, and I write Alaska Wilderness Mysteries. I've written four novels set in the wilderness of Kodiak Island. I also write a monthly newsletter about murder and mystery in Alaska. Check the show notes for more information on my novels and my newsletter. I'll be back soon with the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier.